this is a later illustration of Pip saying farewell to Joe. Actually, uh, it's a, an illustration of a later scene. <clears throat> but I was interested if anybody else had been shocked to discover their own snobbery. And because snobbery is such a theme in this uh, part of the book, becoming a snob. And I discovered it's kind of a rhetorical question, but I've been shocked to discover my own snobbery. It happened when, for some reason at my school, the custodial staff started using the teacher's lounge last room. And I was really displeased to see the custodial staff in our room. <laughs> so I had to work with myself to decide that this was okay after all. But here Pip is becoming a snob. But I, I don't suppose anyone else has been shocked by snobbery, okay. <laughs> Oh, we can go to the next slide, I guess, Ava. Yeah. This is a, a, a movie, one of the movies, I believe that's Pip and Joe. And maybe the third with the cartoon. There it is, yeah. So does anyone want to share an experience of snobbery with us or not? Then we'll move on. Uh, I believe three people have their hand way, Sorry. Way, sorry, I can't see their names with my screen share. Apologies. Okay, I've got it, I think. I can get it to open up. Okay, uh, yeah, let's see, Martha and then Dorothy and then Barbara. Martha? Can't hear you. Martha, you're muted. Is it okay now? Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate you bringing up this topic, but I never thought of uh, thought of it as snobbery. I thought of it as Pip being this young boy who's been exposed to this new situation, mm -hmm. and he is so enamored by Estella that he just wants these things. He wants he wants a better mm -hmm. life. He and I don't I don't know if you call that snobbery or just um, these wild childhood or young person right. um, um, desires and uh, kind of gets them in trouble quite a bit, you know? I think that's very accurate. I think maybe later on when he's a bit older, we might call him a snob, okay. but it's, uh, yeah, you're right. In this, in this portion, he's just enchanted by what he thinks is, I guess, the elegant life and and i really felt for him because i um you know i was thinking back to my own childhood and and what what i wanted and what i didn't want and i'm thinking you know i think every young person goes through this they see some things that they like that they want maybe they can't have it for whatever reason uh and um it's just something you go through during childhood True. and True. young adulthood yeah. before you get to adulthood when you start being a little bit more um careful about what you wish i think for. that's true yeah uh, dorothy you had something your question reminded me of something i had always thought of as embarrassment but i realize now it was kind of snobbish I was quite young. My mother had a curtain business and she, some people had not come to pick up their curtains. And so she decided I should deliver them. And one of the deliveries was to a local bar. Now I oh. was about <laughs> 12 and I had to walk into this bar. And I was really very chagrined about doing so and was afraid that somebody I knew would see me walk into this bar with curtain curtains in order to collect money for my mother. 
and I realized it was very snobbish of me. Yes, uh, of unf unfamiliar territory. Let's see, Barbara, you had a point too. Yeah, well, I'm not quite ready to confess my snobbery, but I'll tell a story that you guys might like. It, in when I was treat, teaching, tree, teaching uh, students in uh, graduate school in uh, education, I had this one woman who uh, she's she lives in Seaside, California, and she decided that it was her what she needed to do is go into all the grocery stores around her area and tell the managers that in the quick check line, it has to be 15 items or fewer, not 15 items or less. <laughs> <laughs> and that was her little campaign. It wasn't too uh, well received, but she <laughs> kept on with her plan. Yes, there's such a thing as grammar snobs. <laughs> or addiction snobs. And uh, let's see, Shana, is that the correct yeah. pronunciation? Yeah, yeah, Shana. Shana. So, Shana, uh, yeah, so I, I, my little story is that I grew up in California. And, you know, I, you know, I lived all over the place in California. And then when I um, was getting ready to get married to my husband, I went back east to New Jersey. And I met my in-laws and I met these people that, that was had a completely street. different view of life than I, I mean, they were like, you had to use the fork the right way and all that kind of stuff. So they were kind of very snobby and they took me to <laughs> a country club and I didn't have the right clothes and I didn't have the right, you know what I mean? So. As a California girl, you know, it was just like, oh, my God. And I realized that when I went to be with them now, I had to act a certain way. And if I didn't act a certain way, and I think that's what happened with Pip, too, is that he had to, when he started to be a gentleman, he had to eat with the right fork. Remember, he was corrected on how to eat. So I kind of felt that way. You know, they have so many forks. You know, I couldn't believe this one's for this, this one's for that, so... I learned that yes, people could be snobby. <laughs> this is money. Not all East Coast people are snobby, but <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's yes, see. I think that's good. We can be be the object of snobbery as well. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I'll just generalize in my professional experience, I occasionally had to deal with people who had a superiority complex, uh, mm -hmm. that this was an education mm -hmm. and it was very, very difficult. I mean, they these are people who really thought they were superior to uh, mere teaching staff, shall we say. <laughs> and uh, that created a lot of tension in the workplace. Let's see, uh, Karen had a hand up. Yeah, I think Carolyn was ahead of me. I've said Carolyn, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Oh, well, this is just a per little personal recollection. I remember when I'd <laughs> meet people, say my daughter's friends or just general people, because, you know, I lived a lot of different places, you know, in the conversation, I'd say, so like, where'd you go to school? Not in a harsh way. And so, um, you know, to me, it was very interesting. And um, my daughter said to me, she said, you are such an educational snob. And she was <laughs> just so, just so horrified. And I was about to argue with her. And then I said, you know what? I am. I think, you know, it's to me, it's, it's, a, it's, it's about their intelligence and the circumstances they were able to go there. And I've always um, been rather prejudiced educationally about where my doctors went to medical school. Um, nothing personal Californians, but I always felt that they needed to go to school 
east of the Mississippi. So, um, yeah, anyway, that was my personal snobbery. <laughs> yes, I look out for that telltale but statements like he's from Alabama, but he's very intelligent. <laughs> That's snobbery. <laughs> <laughs> okay am i next i think um hey, yeah karen yeah um if we bring it back to the text a little bit i think that what pip is experiencing is his first introduction to a class consciousness and yes. maybe some kind of pride and i think dickens uses hands a lot symbolically hands in this novel are a very important element I think yes. in this first section, we have Joe's hands represented, the forger's hands, the working man. They're big and they're common. Mm -hmm. uh, Pip's hands are noticed by Estella as being not like somebody more refined. And anytime I see that Pip again is brought up by hand, um, anytime I see the word hand in this novel, I circle it and it always means something important. And the other thing I had a thought about that we didn't really talk about, maybe it it's helpful at the beginning of the novel, is how cleverly Dickens uses a palindrome here, meaning that something backwards is the same as it's read forwards. I mean, we have Pip, Pirrup, Philip. They're all read the same backwards and forwards. And I think the message or the journey that can be made out of how Dickens uses palindrome here is that you end up where you begin. And um, that's yeah. sort of the wraparound um, without too much of a spoiler. I'm sure we've all read um, Great Expectations, but Pip pretty much ends up where he begins. So, Yes, uh, you mentioned the text. Would someone like to read a little bit of Pip's, uh, well, maybe nascent snobbery. It's the beginning of chapter 14, first two paragraphs. Any volunteers to read? Beginning of chapter 14, first two paragraphs. Martha, thank you. All right. Okay. 14. Go for it. Yes. It is a most miserable thing to feel ashamed of home. There may be black ingrate in the thing, and the punishment may be retributive and well deserved, but that it is a miserable thing, I can testify. Home had never been a very pleasant place for me because of my sister's temper. But Joe had I'm sorry, sanctified it and I had believed in it. I had believed in the best parlor as a most elegant saloon. I had believed in the front door as a mysterious portal of the temple of state whose solemn opening was attended with a sacrifice of roast fowls. I had believed in the kitchen as a chaste, though not magnificent, apartment. I had believed in the forge as the glowing road to manhood and independence. Within a single year, all this was changed. Now it was all coarse and common, and I would not have had Miss Havisham and Estella see it on any account. How much of my ungracious condition of mine may have been my own fault, how much Miss Havisham's, how much my sister's, is now of no import to me or to anyone. The change was made in me. The thing was done, well or ill done, excusably or inexcusably, it was done. Oh, well, thanks. Good. Good reading. And it was done. I mean, that that really, mm -hmm. it's a really dramatic section. <clears throat> There's a, there was an episode in Dickens' life when he was working at the blacking factory you may have read this, but <clears throat> no, nobody, but well, one of his friends in the factory wanted to accompany him, accompany little Charles home. Charles, I think was 12 at this time. Correct me if I'm wrong. So Dickens led him to a house in a very respectable street, probably a row house, townhouse. And it went up to the door and, and told the, his friend, well, this is where I live. And then the friend left. Of course, it was uh, uh, not where Dickens lived at all. So Dickens was at that point, obviously ashamed of home. Now, someone 
had brought this up and I wanted to be, I got three hands here. Barbara, so, oh, sorry, Barbara. <clears throat> oh, oh, Barbara Frankel? Yes. Yes, I, how, I just wanted to say hello. I missed the first installment. I was going to say something about hands, but also in terms of snobbery and clothes, Estella also looked at his shoes and, and said how coarse his shoes were. So the snobbery, as someone said about the hands, it was also, it began with, as it is in these paragraphs with him, noticing how his attire didn't quite make the mark with Habersham and Estella. Yes, yeah. It puts him in a, in a definitely, a, it, it identifies his class, his working class. Of course, yes, he was coarse. And Rick. Yes. Um, <clears throat> somebody mentioned it earlier, and I, I got the same thing going on here. I've been very surprised, actually, at the number of people as literate as we are on this group who use I when they should use me. <laughs> yes. So it's so common, and I found that it does not seem to relate closely to intelligence sort of an ear thing mm -hmm. my son is way smarter than i am and he still has the problem and i've corrected it many times <laughs> and he's not yeah. fighting back. He's there's a similar mistake that may irritate you as well people who who use myself when they should use me exactly. <laughs> horror <laughs> that, that is another one and and some of this is i call erring upward and by the way, I'm I'm a snob in the turn, and then I'm big on saying er rather than air. <laughs> so I looked that one up a long time ago, but I, I am some something of an editor snob, <laughs> and that it really all these things bug me, and I've been surprised to learn that they they don't seem to relate all that closely to intelligence or literacy, but more to something like either you have perfect pitch or you don't kind of problem. It's something else altogether. But there's one snobbery thing that I've been act I've been particularly bothered by that happens to me. I don't have a PhD. Now, I'm not a professor right now, although I was part-time at Berkeley a little while ago, like 30-some years ago, in, in one of the less academic departments. But uh, I've hung out with professors. I was uh, actually uh, working for a bunch of them once. And I felt like they, most of them were looking down on me because I didn't have a PhD. And I, yeah. on the other hand, I've had debates with professors over a book I wrote about homelessness, where I beat the crap out of them. <laughs> they were just wrong. And yet, you know, and I, I could prove that now, but but uh, so it, it's that that one really bugs me. I gotta say that uh, somehow if you have a PhD and you're around a university people, if you don't have a PhD and you're around them, it just about doesn't matter what other what else you might have accomplished. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. There we are. <laughs> yes, I I have to say. One of the great things about the Dickens universe is there appears to be uh, far less snobbery than I found in academia in general, far less. <clears throat> Let's, I, I wanted to get to a question that came up. That is, okay, Pip sees something at Satis House that makes him ashamed of home, changes him. And I'm thinking, what the hell? Satis House, Miss Havisham? This uh, enchants him? Can anyone explain if this works? I mean, I would, I'm just, I would think it might be just too freakish to make Pip desire to live any kind of life like that. What do you think? Can you can you repeat the question? Oh, 
that is Pip seems to be enchanted with what he experiences at Satis house and makes him a, consequently ashamed of home and his life in the forge. But it's hard for me sometimes to believe that what he sees at Santa's house would be enchanting to a young boy. They insult him, yeah. but it's not really an elegant place. <clears throat> He's more enchanted by Estella. Right, exactly. I don't think it's the place that he finds so enchanting at all. Great. Yeah, exactly. I think yeah. it has nothing to do with the place as much as Estella, who points out to him um, how inadequate he is. And that's his first experience of shame, I think. And Dickens' own need in himself to better himself with his first love, with wanting to, you know, be know how he had felt like he had to make himself better and be a better husband. I, I agree. I think it's all about his fascination and fixation on Estella and yes. everything she represents to him. Very true. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Maria Biednell's father thought that Dickens was too low class for his daughter. <laughs> yes, yes. And that was his impetus to want to do better, to make himself yes. better, to impress mm -hmm. the family. I mean, you know, he was sending her notes, you know, in a clandestine way, which we weren't sure uh, about whether that's because Maria wanted it or her family just didn't feel he was, you know, professional enough. <clears throat> well, uh, Wayne. Yes, yes please. please. I lost my hand count here. Glenna, Barbara, and David had their hands up. My screen is not behaving. Let's see. I'm sorry. Who was first, Ava? Glenna had her hand Glenna, raised. Glenna, please. Hands. Yes. Okay. Well, what I was going to say is, I hear you, Wayne, about the, what shall I say, unsavory elements of Status House, but there's a kind of decadent glamour. Uh, I mean, there's literatures and, you know, the arts in general are, are full of images. I'm thinking of the documentary about the sisters, Grey Gardens, for example. People are fascinated <clears throat> by decaying uh, glamour. And, mm -hmm. you know, in an odd way, it could have, I mean, obviously, Estella is the big deal. But Pip can see that people are living on a scale unknown to him even though it's decayed. And uh, I think, mm -hmm. True. you know, I think people, there's a fascination. I agree, even that, yeah, the decayed mansion is still impressive. David, you were at a hand up. One of the things I was noticing in rereading this time <clears throat> is what a strong sense of guilt Pip has of uh, from his sister's treatment i think there's a, there's a principle which is that if you're punished if you're a child if you're punished you think you must have done something wrong and when he goes to satis house and estella looks down on him he feels guilty about his class. I think that's what's, that's why he's so impressed by it. If they're looking down on, on him, he feels they must be superior. Yes. <clears throat> um, Dan and Dorothy and John. Dorothy, thank you. All yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, going back to the the observations on, say, this house, however dilapidated it might be or however kind of uh, run down things might look, and it still Pip kind of still associates 
uh, Miss Havisham and Estella with Miss Havisham uptown. She's still uptown. She's still kind of middle class. And this is kind of a, uh, like someone said before, fixation that he develops, that he attaches his identity to, um, that really he you know, he's never going to resolve. And I think really no matter how... <laughs> you know, run down things are how, frankly, you know, um, problematic, you know, the, the association might be there. Um, it's still a, it's still an aspiration for that middle class. And it's an aspiration for this kind of aesthetic, this kind of ethos uh, that he's not born with. And, and furthermore, that that is something that is, is becomes a conviction that he doesn't have when he, he he's kind of, it's kind of reinforced by Estella. So I wonder, you I mean, however, uh, problematic, you know, the, the middle class itself is, I mean, it's still something Pip is, is going to, to really, um, see as superior to what he has. And it's going to be this thing that replaces, you know, the, the real, um, identity that he's going to have, um, you know, with the forge and with his own, with his mother and with Joe. Yes. I, I've always long felt that, um, <clears throat> yeah, Pip almost, uh, is it drawn to Estella's haughtiness <clears throat> that may feed into his pride? I am trying to, I always lose the place where Estella slaps him. It's on page 82 in chapter 11. This is just before he meets Estella, uh, Miss Havisham's family. And let's see, it's one, two, oh, three pages into sh chapter 11. Uh, this, is a, this is the slap. And then the subsequent kiss occurs after she has watched the fight with the pale young gentleman. Yeah, that's on page 93. In chapter in the end of chapter 11 near the end of chapter 11 <clears throat> can anyone explain this young woman or is it impossible to explain her <laughs> and pip's attraction to her oh, i'm sorry I wanted, Dorothy? I wanted to speak about chapter 11 in conjunction with your you. earlier yes. question his encounter with the pale young gentleman, which I think marked also a difference in class. Even though Pip defeats the gentleman, he speaks about his spirit inspiring me with great respect and that he only felt a gloomy satisfaction in his victory because of the behavior of the young man, which seemed in contrast to his own. He thought of himself as a species of, quote, savage young wolf. And let's see, John, you're next. John Jordan. Yes, I, I was going to go back to something that David uh, uh, Brownell brought up, which is the, the question of Pip's guilt. Um, but in the passage at the beginning of, of chapter 14, the first thing that Pip says is, it's the most miserable thing to feel ashamed of home. So I'm interested in the question of shame and guilt and what the difference is between shame and guilt. What does Pip feel guilty about? And what does he feel shamed of, ashamed about? And what's the difference in a broader sense between guilt and shame? I think so, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's like Sada's house, that Ad puts shame on top of his guilt. Uh, let's see, Barbara, you were waiting. Barbara Frankel. Yes, I see. I don't quite understand Pip's feeling of guilt. I see Estella as Miss Havisham's animal. She was honed and and sculpted to to be that way. And I can see her slapping him and then kissing him to torment him. She was made to torment. 
and it says that um, I felt that kiss was given to the coarse common boy as a piece of money might have been, and that it was worth nothing. You know, it, she's so transactional, as Havisham, you know, trained her to be transactional. And he is lost. He's lost in those feelings, I think, because of his inexperience and because of his his own, you know, confusion of his self-worth. I I also see, like I said, so much of Dickens there with his own first love, how lost he was in them as 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 that young boy, you know, as when he was just starting out in the world. But I, I, I just see Estella trained, like almost trained, like there almost is no Estella. This is what she was trained to do. So. Yes, I like the, your implication that Estella certainly throws Pip off balance. <laughs> yeah, he's lost. Yeah. He's gone in his yeah. fascination. And it, she, she's like, you know, the gyroscope of, of, of his confusion. Very good. Oh, Karen, you had a hand up. Yeah, um, if we can go back to John's distinction or wanting to draw a distinction between shame and guilt. I think of shame more related to self-esteem issues and pride or status. And I see guilt more related to a sense of moral consciousness or moral discomfort and conscience. And it just I was going through some papers and I came across, remember when we did Dickens to go at the beginning of COVID in 2021, and I had this little note stuck in great expectations in my book, a summer star um, talked about moral conscience and moral consciousness and how in great expectations, Dickens brings this whole moral experience into a more material consciousness, the way objects, he uses objects to talk to us. And she used the example, and maybe this is a good distinction about John's point, that when Pip, Pip is first challenged in terms of his moral conscience, when he hides the bread for the convict, and he's got this moral discomfort and the metaphor, the buttered bread dripping down the leg of his pants, you know, it just makes it so material and his distress about what he's doing. And at that point, the kick in of guilt, you know, for doing something sort of like a good Samaritan would do, Dickens's favorite parable, but it brings him great distress. Well, yes, that's a very interesting observation. I'm going to fall back on my good old buddy, Sigmund Freud. The sense of guilt for Pip would come not from his sister, but because he can't be as good as Joe. Joe is so good and so loving and so able to accept his wife's cruelty and Pip can't be that way or at least he feels he can't be as good as joe uh, of course this is uh you know freud's idea is that guilt comes uh through the indirectly from subconscious mind so i just want to throw that out there that uh as that that he feels guilty not because his sister is mean or even his his theft is not something that Joe would do. Let me put it that way. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of good scholarship's been done on Pip's guilt. If you want to pursue that, I think the seminal essay, which I couldn't get copy for you, but one of the essays that I did get includes that uh, early work on Pip's guilt and see who was first here, uh, Barbara? Barbara Rainey. Yes, I, I was very struck in reading it this time about just about what you're talking about, how how early on he he really is aware of how good Joe is and how um, morally pure Joe is. And yet, you know, he, he 
does not take that as the way of his future or does not think that's the way of his future but i had forgotten that he he has those feelings um, of understanding how good joe is early on because he very quickly becomes embarrassed of him and virginia thank you very much barbara virginia um, yeah, uh, two things. One, I think guilt always usually comes from a specific action, like stealing something and you feel guilty for it, where shame is sort of more of an internal thing that you feel bad about and you can't necessarily put a cause on it, like why you're ashamed of where you live or what you do. There's not necessarily a cause to that. It's more of an internal feeling. But I also want to mention with Estella, you know, kissing him after the fight. I mean, that's so typical, like the two boys were fighting over her. And so, you know, suddenly she thinks that's great that they were fighting over her, <laughs> fed her ego. Yeah. And so it fed her ego like these two guys were battling it out. And the other kid was willing to get socked silly, uh, you know, over Estella. And so she kissed him just because, oh, good, you know, you fought for me. Um, and of course, it's confusing to Pip because he didn't even know what he did. I mean, he wasn't unaware of what her thoughts were on the matter. And anyway, that's what I thought about uh, her section where she decided to kiss him. So true. I, I think that it matters to Estella that Pip uh, knocks the pale young gentleman onto the floor and, and with one blow, it's all it takes. <laughs> and this foreshadows a later scene that we'll talk about later anyway. But yeah, I think uh, Estella is impressed uh, by what Pip has done. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> And uh, let's see, Kath, Tiger? Tiger, yeah, yeah uh, two uh, quick yeah. points. One is that um, Pip goes to church. Pip is a churchgoer with his people and um, the church would have um, had given him the concepts of shame and guilt, sure, certainly of guilt. Um, so uh, Dickens doesn't go into detail about that, but um, if you look at the context of the time, that would be um, that would be there. And another idea I had is that to me, Estella is a classical, a classic um, narcissist who does these tactics. Like one day they'll ask you to marry them, and the next day they'll. They'll, I don't know what shame you to death so um <laughs> that that reminded me of people I've known and uh yeah um okay that's what I have I've been seeing a lot of narcissism in Estella she's not well she's not a healthy human being as we know thank you yes if I'm not wrong the True narcissist wants love and attention, but doesn't want to give either one. <laughs> it's a one-way street. <laughs> yeah. On the question of, um, and maybe some other experts could help me on this, but the question of the uh, way children are treated, uh, this is early 19th century when the idea of the child was still probably based on the, the idea that they had to learn to be virtuous. And, but in the course of the 19th century, the, the, the general vision of childhood modified and we get sometimes the angelic child is, for example, originated in Wordsworth and imitation, in, intimations of immortality. So I just want to throw out the possibility that those scenes when the adults are uh, trying to shame Pip are comical, but they're comical only because by 1860, I think a reader would be less inclined to believe that the child uh, ch children were naturally evil and naturally vicious. <laughs> and so this is, a, I guess, a vestige of an earlier view of childhood that 
perhaps was meant to be funny. If anyone wants a little pop uh, introduction to this double view of children, uh, watch The Bad Seed, which is about a 1955 movie with Kathy McCormick. It is a wonderful movie because it, it sort of turns on head to head the idea of the angelic child. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's see, where does that leave us? Yeah, we're talking about Pip and his attraction to Estella, I guess. <clears throat> I wanted to do a little work with Dickens. Wayne? Oh, please, please go ahead, yeah. So, oh, sorry, someone had their hand up, but they've put it down, Never mind. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Continue. Sorry, Wayne, uh, that, that was just me. I was, uh, okay. because of the comment that you made earlier about the difference in the time frame. I wasn't aware that there was that this was not set in the time that it was written. Um, right. What is the the time gap between the time that this was written and when it was set? I critics generally say that the graveyard scene probably took place in 1812 when Pip is seven years old but the book was published in 1860. Okay. Yes, if I'm not mistaken. So it's quite a difference in time. Yeah, so it and is, it is, it, time it is in that He wrote this at the end of his Sorry, life and was talking about uh, his youth, which you know, gives you enough time for everything to have fallen out of fashion. Yes, right, yeah. At least enough people would think that the old idea of the wicked child was out of date. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, have to beat the I, devil out of the child or shame the devil out of the child. Uh, John, would you agree that we have a new vision of children in the, in the 19th century? <laughs> I, I, was, I was gonna comment on the time frame of the oh, novel. Oh, thank you. Uh, there, there, there's one uh, piece of information that dates this earlier than 1839 because the Bow Street Runners are the police who come to investigate the attack on Mrs. Joe. And the Bow Street Runners were the early version of the Metropolitan Police in London. Um, so they have come out to the village where uh, Joe and, and Pumblechook uh, live uh, to investigate. And they're sort of the comic version of the police there before the modern bobbies and uh, th that are named after Sir Robert Peel. And that's the establishment of the Metropolitan Police in London uh, in 1839. I think that's the correct date. Mm -hmm. So um, these are, and their investigation is, is comic because they, uh, they're unable to find the, uh, the assailant. Um, but another thing more generally is that this is set in a, in a pre-industrial uh, England. This is, this is not the, uh, the England of hard times and factories. It's uh, uh, the, the, the center of this is a small rural village or a small village in a larger rural setting with farmers and uh, um, and, and and Joe is a skilled artisan, but he's not someone who works in a in a factory. So the class system here has not, uh, although the industrial revolution is underway in other parts of the country, it's uh, it, it hasn't reached this this particular village. So it's early nineteenth century. Thanks very much, John. And uh, Ava, you had a, no, no, Glenna, I'm sorry, Glenna. I wanted to say about the issue of the, of the child, <clears throat> uh, as a historian, <clears throat> I always thought that it really beginning in the 18th century, you see various ways of patriarchy being eroded. Uh, the, at one point, the father is really the, the source of authority in the family. And then you get um, 
changing norms where the marriage becomes more companionate, less um, less of uh, the father being the the one that has the say. And as a marriage becomes more companionate and a family becomes more democratic, these these transitions start in the 18th century and begin to flower in the 19th century. And then children also begin to see, you know, have have a different role in the family. So, yes, uh, the, I think Longfellow has a poem about his daughters uh, charging him in his easy chair and how wonderful it is. Forgotten what it's called, but <laughs> oh, and that is 1840s, maybe 30s or 40s. Uh, David, no. The children's hour. Children's hour. Thank you. That's it. Yeah, the angelic daughters uh, and Martha. <laughs> I made the comment about um, that this this was a period of time when um, I, I just don't want us to forget that he is still being abused by his sister quite a bit. He's yelled at. I think she, you know, takes a broom and you know hits him with it, and, and et cetera. So he's not in a a good place there. Yes, I agree. I think that while children were probably beaten more than than we would like, but Pip is Pip is beaten more than normally and made to take lax laxatives, which is really disturbing. I think. Yeah. If you're interested in Victorian childhood, there's a wonderful book by Catherine Robeson, who is an important member of a feature of the Dickens universe. If you've been lucky, if you're ever lucky enough to hear her talk, she is wonderful. wonderful. She's wonderful. She is wonderful. But her book, Men in Wonderland, mm -hmm. The Lost Girlhood of Victorian Gentlemen. <laughs> But she gives in detail the not so much the adulation of children, but the adulation of, of little girls uh, in in the in this period. <laughs> and that takes me. I wanted to look a little more at the humor, and I wanted to look at to begin with at the meeting with. Uh, the first time we see Jaggers, and that's on page 83 in the Penguin. Yeah, and it's uh, about the fourth page in the chapter 11. This is shortly after Estella slaps Pip, but he Pip goes in to the, to the house and he's, uh, he meets Jaggers coming downstairs. Wonderful description of Jaggers, first of all. <clears throat> but I'm just gonna read here, middle of page 83. Boy of the neighborhood, eh? Yes, sir. How do you come here? Miss Havisham sent for me, sir. Well, behave yourself. I have a pretty large experience of boys, and you're a bad set of fellows. Now mind. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Jaggers is, uh, turns out to be crucial to the plot. He, of course, he's the attorney whom I guess Miss Havisham contacted when she wanted to adopt a child. Well, no, that's, I'm sorry, that's going too far. But he's an attorney, yeah. So <laughs> if you want to look at the literary pedigree of this guy, it's Dowling in Tom Jones. Uh, Dowling is a very important character. He's an, but he's an attorney and well, aptly named. Let's see. Yeah, pretty bad log altogether. We talk Wayne, about 
Go ahead, John's please. John's raised his hand. Yeah, John, yes. please. Uh, could, uh, yes. I just wanted to comment on, on a, uh, something very small in the passage that you just read about this, this uh, <laughs> encounter on the stairs. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, the, the mysterious person whose, whose name we do not know we are not given the name of this this person yet, though he will turn out to be that lawyer Jaggers whom you True. Uh, referred to. But he said, he says, I have a pretty large experience of boys and you're a bad set of fellows. And I wanted the word I wanted to focus on is fellows. And the word fellow has an interesting use and set of connotations in the 19th century that we may not be sensitive to. And the word fellow, uh, which I think we use in a kind of neutral way, has class implications in the 19th century. And when uh, the pale young gentleman in this very same chapter uh, encounters Pip in the garden, he says, Hello, young fellow. And so that word fellow uh, used by the pale young gentleman is a way of putting Pip in his place. And when Jaggers, the mysterious man on the stairs, encounters Pip and he says, boys, uh, bad fellows, a bad set of fellows, there's also a, 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 an, an implication uh, about Pip's relative class status. So this book is, uh, it, it's suffused with class references. Well, I wanted to look at, uh, this will be a way of looking further at Mrs. Joe and at comedy and the fight. I wanted to spend some time on the, or the very brief uh, contretemps between uh, Orlick and Joe. I'm on page 114 and chapter 15. And Wait, it's Barbara has her hand. Third page. Okay, Barbara, sorry. Barbara. Well, I just didn't want to leave this passage without looking at the physical description <laughs> of um, Jaggers. He was prematurely bald on the top of his head and had bushy black eyebrows that wouldn't lie down, but stood up bristling. His eyes were very were set very deep in his head and were disagreeably sharp and suspicious. Um, that's a lovely detail about the eyebrow <coughs> and how they refuse to lie down I think <laughs> that description of Jaggers I think is one of the sharpest in the novel it's very very short and very vivid yes yes well let's see I wanted the contretemps here it starts on page 114 it's in chapter 15. Let's see, about uh, the sixth page in chapter 15, page 114. Dickens has a way of making sure that what goes around comes around. Evil people are typically punished eventually. Am I wrong about that? <laughs> we may have to wait, but uh, Fagin is hanged and uh, Bill Sykes falls to his death, etc. But this passage begins, you're a foul shrew, Mother Gartree growled the journeyman. If that makes a judge of rogues, you ought to be gooden. Uh, Orlick has, uh, of course, just now appeared in the novel, though we're told that he's been employed by Joe for some time. Pip remembers him. Pip is a child, uh, uh, remembers being a child when Orlick was employed. 
And a lot has been written about Orlik as a kind of embodiment of uh, aggression and uncontrolled impulses and evil. Anyone want to comment on why Orlik appears only now when he's supposedly been in, been there for some time? A mention is that Pitt mentions him only now. Yes, please go ahead. Irene? Please, yeah, go ahead. Uh, just, I mean, because he is now going to be instrumental in the, in the action, mm -hmm. he, we may not immediately realize so, but uh, uh, it, you know, his, first of all, the fight between him and Joe, and then mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, over the argument about the half day off. And so on. <laughs> <laughs> So it basically, we need him now. He enters the story now because he plays an important part starting here, yeah. I have to comment that I have, I've observed bullies and uh, of course among adolescent boys. And the bully exerts a fascination because he acts out and he does things that the noise bo nice boys would not do but they love seeing the bully do them. <laughs> and I'm suspicious that Orlick acts out and he does things that Pip and Joe, or says things, wouldn't do. But we, at least as readers, uh, enjoy seeing some of the Orlick getting away with what he does get away with. You're a foul shrew. Would, now, I want to look at the wonderful depiction of Mrs. Joe here. Would anyone continue reading for us? What did you say? Cried my sister. <laughs> Any volunteers to read? Uh, I think from? prior to that, we had a couple hand raised. Sure. Yeah, Barbara was. Barbara, here. Shana, and then Louise. Yeah. Well, following the same line that you had there, we don't, <laughs> we don't get Biddy. He introduced to Biddy until rather after the fact. Mm -hmm. She's talked about early on, but then all of a sudden, you know, she's very important. Mm -hmm. And um, and we have that whole uh, section where we're talking about how he talks to her about things that he doesn't talk to anybody else and all that kind of stuff. And it, it seems to me like she's kind of, that's another plot end that's going to have to be dealt with, right? If you and so we, we're we're introducing things that have to be resolved somewhere. Yes, uh, I've I've always wondered why she's called Biddy, such an unappealing name. Yeah, Biddy uh, and Shana. Um, isn't Pip? suspicious of Orlick uh yeah. oh, when yeah. she gets when when she gets hurt I mean isn't he feels that he did it or am I wrong on that well can I just po point out one place here mm -hmm. um he knows early on that that Orlick is jealous of him okay and, and he says that and I love this line he says I only noticed that when he always beat his sparks in my direction, <laughs> and then yeah. at that whenever I sang "Old Clem," he came in out of time. Yes. <laughs> really annoying behavior. <laughs> <laughs> so he knows about him. Yes. Orlick is always slouching. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very nonchalant. Shana, did you finish? Shana? 
Yeah, yeah, I, I was done. That's what I just wondered if he was suspicious of him. I mean, from the get go, I just feel like Pip is just doesn't like him and is very suspicious of him. From a, a, you know, and as the story goes on, he gets he you know more and more. <laughs> so. Yeah, true, true. Well, it's very obvious that you know, sort of what happened there, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Buell is, is no longer able to speak. Uh, it, it, you know, that is expecting uh, that Orlick that she'll be afraid of Orlick, and he's really surprised by her reaction to Orlick because he thinks that Orlick probably was the one responsible for hurting her. Mm -hmm. no, I don't. I... Go ahead. Is that... Louise. Oh, thanks. Uh, you know, at this point, um, I would have thought that that Pip would have felt some guilt. Pip is asking for a half day off to go do something he wants to do downtown. And Orlick, you know, stick either sticks up for himself or does something to goad Pip and Joe. And um, Mrs. Joe you know, comes unglued because Joe is giving <clears throat> or thinking about giving them both a half a day off. Um, and, um, you know, Pip, you know, as far as we've read so far, never seems to look back and say, said, you know, uh, that argument ensued because of something I wanted to do. He just gets dressed and goes downtown. And in spite of his sister being apoplectic at that point. So to me, I, Pip went down in my estimation at that, at that point. Not that I think he owes Mrs. Joe anything. You know, she's been she's been so harsh, but she is an anchor tenant in that little family. And he just goes on downtown as if, hey, I got the half day off, la -di da to all the rest of you. Yeah, let's see. And uh, let's see, Louise oh, and Sarah. Sarah. Yeah. Sarah. Uh, I, I, I didn't think that Pips, Pips suspected Oleg I mean, he thinks a lot about uh, the sequence of events and uh, through the people that may be suspected. And he kind of decides that it couldn't have been Oli. He traces how they walk together uh, for the half day off and how they met and walked back together. So he, he doesn't suspect him as far as I could tell. And, and there is a, another interesting thing because He's always, when we talked about guilt, he's always feels guilty that he didn't tell the truth about the events with the two uh, criminals. And now he makes a decision uh, uh, because now, now this, this file is involved, the thing is involved, and he makes a decision. He thinks about, again about him not telling anything about it, and he makes a decision that if the information can help solve the problem he's going to tell. But he has no, he hasn't concluded who did it. He definitely didn't conclude that Orlik did it. He never tells Joe that uh, he stole the file. But he says here, yeah, and he thinks about it a lot. From the beginning, he, he tries to meditate on why he doesn't tell Joe. And this is part mm -hmm. of, of the guilt. But here he says, if this information will help the investigation, he makes a decision. If, mm -hmm. if telling the truth will help the investigation, he'll tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sarah, and then John? No, I was Sarah. <laughs> okay, then John is next. If if you would indulge me, Wayne, I'd like to read the entire passage of the fight between Joe and Orlick. Oh, that would be perfect. Because I think I think it's just wonderful. It's it's an instance of comedy, but I think it has other valuable things that we can learn from. So I'm gonna 
uh, it's in uh, it's in chapter fifteen, right? It's the um, yes, yes. So I'm I'm going to start a little bit earlier, and it's after uh, Joe agrees to give Orlick the half day off. And Mrs. Joe speaks first, and she says, "Like you, you fool," said she to Joe, giving holidays to great idle hulkers like that. You're a rich man upon my life to waste wages in that way. I wish I was his master. You'd be everybody's master if you durst, retarded, retarded Orlick with an ill-favored grin. Let her alone, said Joe. And notice the parentheses around what Joe says there. That's, that's something that can't, you can only appreciate that when you read it typographically. Um, so, uh, we'll come back to that. I'd be a match for all the noodles and all rogues, returned my sister, beginning to work herself into a mighty rage. And I couldn't be a match for the noodles without being a match for your master, who's the dunderheaded king of the noodles. And I couldn't be a match for the rogues without being a match for you, who are the blackest looking and the worst rogue between this and France now. You're a foul shrew, Mother Gargery, growled the journeyman. If that makes a judge of rogues, you ought to be a good un. Let her alone, will you, said Joe. What did you say, cried my sister, beginning to scream. What did you say? What did that fellow Orlick say to me, Pip? What did he call me with my husband standing by? Oh, oh, oh. Each of these <laughs> exclamations was a shriek, and I must remark of my sister, what is equally true of all the violent women I have ever seen, that the passion was no excuse for her, because it is undeniable that instead of lapsing into passion, she, she consciously and deliberately took extraordinary pains to force herself into it, and became blindly furious by regular stages. What was the name that he gave me before the base man who swore to defend me? Oh, hold me. Oh, oh the ground journeyman between his teeth. I'd hold you if you was my wife. I'd hold you under the pump and I'd choke it out of you. I tell you, let her alone, said Joe. Oh, to hear him, cried my sister with a clap of her hands and a scream together, which was her next stage. To hear the names he's giving me, that or that Orlick in my own house, me, a married woman, with my husband standing <laughs> up. Oh, oh. Here my sister, after a fit of clappings and screamings, beat her hands upon her bosom and upon her knees and threw her cap off and pulled her hair down, which were the last stages on her road to frenzy. Being by this time a perfect fury and a complete success, she made a dash at the door, which I had fortunately locked. <laughs> what could the wretched Joe do now? After his disregarded parenthetical interruptions, but stand up to his journeyman and ask him what he meant by interfering betwixt himself and Mrs. Joe, and further whether he was man enough to come on. Old Orlick felt that the situation admitted of nothing less than coming on and was on his defense straightway. So without so much as pulling off their singed and burnt aprons, they went at one another like two giants. But if any man in that neighborhood could stand up being long against Joe, I never saw the man. Orlick, as if he had been of no more account than the pale young gentleman, was very soon among the coal dust and in no hurry to come out of it. Then Joe unlocked the door and picked up my sister who had dropped insensible at the window, but who had seen the fight first, I think, and who was carried into the house and laid down and who was recommended to revive and, and would do nothing but struggle and clench her hands in Joe's hair. Then came that singular calm and silence which succeed all uproars. And then with the vague sensation which I have always connected with such a lull, namely that it was Sunday and somebody was dead, I went upstairs to dress myself. And that's the end of the episode. And then we, time passes and we resume the story. But um, I'm just interested in getting people's comments on this 
passage, which I think is a marvelous, marvelous passage. Funny, but also complex in other ways. So what's going on here? Barbara, you're first. Well, once again, we've got um, Pip realizing the uh, stages of her uh, hysteria or whatever we're going to call it. That's probably too Freudian a word. But anyway, the stages that she goes through when she goes through these um, argumentative things and the you know the oh 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 is kind of building herself up so that she can get all riled up and uh and and putting her hands clenching her hands in joe's hair at the end of all this you know because joe's role is just the muscle you know and he, and that you know he hits him and that's it but she's still in her frenzy and has to wind that down <laughs> somehow <laughs> oh margaret <laughs> this the passage is read by john jordan really revealed why pip could go uptown afterwards and he could go upstairs and get dressed is because he had seen it before and he had registered in his mind even as as or the as the uh as the uh, the adult voice is with the looking with the child's eye, is uh, is remembering that she does go through these stages of of anger, and uh, so that he has seen it all before, and that's why he can get dressed and and go uptown to uh, to see Miss Habisham, and uh, uh, also uh, one of the things that in the description that uh, leapt out at me was the the uh, reference to violent women that the character, the adult character of Pip has seen throughout his life. So she, uh, his sister defined the violence in women or that characteristic that can be a part of a woman's character. And that's all I have to say, but I, I think that um, the narration of this, this novel goes beyond any kind of, um, of uh, of categories of people, you know, defining them as good or evil, that that Dickens' eye was so uh, so clear in looking at characters that uh, you can't really say that they're one dimensional at all, or the major characters are not one dimensional. And Mrs. Joe is is one of them, who is uh, is can in my opinion can't be categorized as as evil. That's what I have to say. <laughs> and we know that that Mrs. Joe is a violent woman because of the way that she treats Pip. Um, right. right. Sarah? Does, Sarah. Yeah. And so I, I, I thought in, in the paragraph that was read, we can see a huge contrast with the, between the way that Joe reacts and the way that Mrs. Joe with her passion and hysteria. And Joe makes comments that are very uh, uh, logical and kind of said in parentheses and without anger. Uh, so he keeps telling uh, uh, Auric, you know, what are you doing? Why are you doing? But everything is very like a calm. And at the end, when they actually get into a fight, um, the behavior of of Joe really affects Oric, and Oric realizes he he cannot fight. He cannot really fight this man, but but there is a small scene of fight, and Mrs. Joe sees this scene and assumes that her husband had a real fight on her behalf. So yeah, everything is very beautiful. Hey, true, very true. Yes, Barbara Franklin. like a stage setting and Dickens' love of theatrics. I see he's setting the stage here for a lot of conflicts coming up. I mean, his writing about hysterical women is always so funny because we know that, you know, uh, uh, 
Pip's sister is, you know, she's no shrinking violet. And here she is screaming for her come up and saying, look at the position she puts Joe into all the time. Here she's making him, she's so angry, she's gonna make him fight with Orlick. And you know, here he he mm. is, you know, he's crafting this place for Orlick that's is almost a foreshadowing of the conflicts that are gonna come later on and seeding the bed for um, you know, his violence toward the sister. But to me, it's, you know, it's it's so brilliant in how he's kind of setting this up. And it's so theatrical and funny and provocative and, um, you know, really, uh, once again, she's just so manipulative and, and, and brutal. Very good. Yes. Yes. Barbara? Yeah. Thank you so much. You got it. Um, we haven't mentioned Tickler. We're talking about all these things, but so Tickler... You know, that's something to be afraid of, right? <laughs> <laughs> and Joe calls it old tickler, you know. But and it seems to be equally applied to Pip and Joe, uh, by Mrs. Joe. And uh, you know, that's another it's kind of funny, right? That she has this whip that she's going to whip them with, but. Uh, it's not totally funny. It's that blackish humor. It's on the edge. <laughs> Carolyn, you have your hand up. Carolyn did. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I couldn't find the little hand. Uh, you know, whenever I read about Mrs. Joe, I'm always struck. What's her backstory? How did she get to such a point, you know, that that's the only way she can navigate her life? You know, what happened to her to create this seemingly monstrous person? I mean, she did take the kid in, you know. Um, anyway, I just think it's interesting, you know, what? what how did she get there? David? I, I think this passage does tell us a lot about Mrs. Joe that we haven't seen before, but David. Well, we know that she didn't marry until late. Joe was not high status, and she ended up being the person who had to be responsible for her orphan brother so that's some of where her anger comes from okay Shana again do you think that um She's angry because she never had children of her own. That I don't know why, you know, she doesn't have children. And, um, you know, maybe she was barren, I, I, you know, and that she couldn't have children. So taking Pip in was kind of like, oh, well, I'm going to have a child now. But then she realized it wasn't her own. So she mistreated him. Do Joe and Mrs. Joe ever have sex? Oh, doesn't sound like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dorothy. I mean, that could be one explanation for why they have no children, couldn't it be? Yeah, and why she's so angry. <laughs> and why she's so angry. Okay, Dorothy. Isn't it strange that she doesn't have a name, a first name? Yes. That's all, I just wonder. Patriarchy at work again. Um, let me, if I may indulge myself in this, I, I think this is a wonderful passage uh, because it's, it's a scene about sex. Um, I think what's happening here is that Mrs. Joe and Orlick are flirting. I think that 
Mrs. Cho is responding to Orlick's aggressive uh, comments about her and admiring or responding emotionally and sexually to his hyper-masculine uh, comments about her. And I think that she is flirting back at him. He's saying, I'd like to hold you. Um, and uh, Mrs. Cho is also commenting on Joe's lack of masculinity. Joe is, jo is ineffectual in this scene. When he tries to intervene, uh, the, the narrative gives us his comments in parentheses because Joe is not being masculine in response to Orlick's masculinity. But finally, Joe is provoked by Mrs. Joe into a fight, which repeats the fight between Pip and the pale young gentleman. And what happens in both cases is that uh, the, um, the more physical of the two males is victorious and gets a reward. Um, in Pip's case, he gets a kiss from Estella. In Joe's case, he gets to carry Mrs. Joe up the stairs. And then let me read this passage to you again, because this is something where we get the child's perspective on adult sexuality. And uh, I think um, uh, if you will trust me uh, a little bit, I have to find my page again. Um, yes. Then Joe unlocked the door, picked up my sister who had dropped insensibly at the insensible at the window, but who had seen the fight first, I think, just as Estella had seen the fight between the, uh, the two boys and who was carried into the house and laid down and who was recommended to revive and would do nothing but struggle and clench her hands in Joe's hair. So this is the beginning of a different kind of passion from the hysterics. Um, then came that singular calm and silence which succeeds all uproars. And then with the vague sensation which I have always connected with such a lull, namely that it was Sunday and somebody was dead, I went upstairs to dress myself. Now, I think this is a subtle joke about the child's perspective of parents who have sex once a week on Sunday. And that silence as if somebody was dead is the silence that follows sexual relations between the parents which the child doesn't understand because the child has no adult knowledge of sexuality. But I think Mrs. Cho has worked herself into a sexual passion by flirting back at Orlick, who's aggressively and sexually flirting with her. And finally, Joe gets aroused to the point where he fights, and then he gets the reward, which is the equivalent of uh, Estella's kiss to Pip. So this is, this is a scene of 19th century sex as understood from the perspective of the child. That's, that's the interpretation that I put on this passage. And Mrs. Joe is one of those women whose sexuality responds to male violence. I think that's so true. I, I can't help but thinking of a controversy that we had in Nashville <clears throat> over the invasion of bachelorettes. Uh, uh, lots of people were offended. And I, I'm thrilled. You know what the bachelorettes are? They, they come to Nashville before the wedding and the, all girls celebrate and they'll get up on a back of a specially built truck with a bar 
and drink and uh, tour the city. So, <laughs> and uh, I, I found it very refreshing that young women can let loose in this way, in a way that would not have been considered proper even maybe 20 years ago. What does anyone make of that pot of beer that shows up <laughs> later? <laughs> Joe and Orlik are sharing a pot of beer from the Jolly Bargeman. The same way that Pip and the Pale Young Gentleman become friends later on. Yes, yes. <laughs> Someone in Sita Cummings said, uh, Orlik strikes me as a quote unquote, lower class of labor, his quote unquote, rebellion against oppression, Mrs. Joe, foretells a shift in social order, a half day for all. Yes, uh, Orlick is d demanding equal time with Pip. And there's, a, there, there's another class dimension here, which this comment is uh, uh, directing our attention to, that Pip is Pip is the apprentice and Orlik is the journeyman. Uh, a journeyman is someone who has finished an apprenticeship and is now working for pay as a day laborer under the master uh, uh, craftsman, Joe. Um, but Pip as an apprentice should be beneath the journeyman in terms of the, uh, the order, the hierarchy but Pip is clearly favored over Orlik. So Orlik's demand for equal time, equal holiday, is a demand for equality. And uh, he's, he's fighting uh, ag against the um, oppression, uh, if you will, or at least the economic superiority claimed by Mrs. Joe, who says, what are you doing giving equal time to him? But there's this other dimension, I think, besides the dimension of class that enters into the um, uh, the rivalry, if you will, and Orlick is uh, is is a is asserting his his wishes with respect to Mrs. Joe. Do 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 people? Go along with. I, I mean, I've given you a, an interpretation of of the scene that says it's about sex. It, uh, it it makes sense because later when she writes a T and they don't understand, and they finally understand, she wants to see him. She wants to see Orlik. So maybe yeah. it, it confirms what you said. Yes. Yes. Um, she she likes. I mean, we we may not approve of this or we may not think it's it's admirable it's 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 a uh, it's anything but admirable that there are some women who like to be treated badly it's a yeah. kind of masochism uh, yeah. and uh, um, it, particularly in a case where joe wonderful sweet and moral as he is is not very masculine. It's one of the things we like about him is that he's really the mother, yeah. he's the maternal yeah. figure. And Mrs. Cho is not feminine in a conventional way. She's the strong one and he's the weak one. And she uses this occasion with Orlik to provoke him to be more masculine and yeah. to meet her sexual needs. And later on, we see that she has a fondness for Orlik, unac unaccountably. Uh, um, She undergoes a transformation in her personality. She becomes sweet and mild. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She gets what she deserves, right? Uh, you make me wonder, John, if if we had a, uh, a doctor here, he might explain what part of her brain was damaged. Dickens yeah. was so knowledgeable 
maybe maybe a, a expert would know what part of her brain would have been damaged to uh, remove that aggression. And I know in some cases with brain damage, uh, there is a personality change, usually toward a expression of emotion. So uh, I, I, I just wonder if Dickens hadn't observed something like this with a personality change after some sort of attack to the head, just a random thought anyway, but <clears throat> well, I don't know I, if anyone's interested in uh, a little more in comedy. I did want to look at the group around Miss Havisham, all of whom hope to inherit her money. And this, of course, replicates other sort of vulture groups, such as uh, in Martin Chuzzlewit, the family gathers around an ill or dying person of wealth, all hoping to impress and make money. And in Martin Chuzzlewit, it's funny because the old man doesn't die, disappoints everyone. But here is the beginning. It, I just want to point out the very beginning when Pitt meets the Pocket family. It's on page 80, which would be the second page of chapter 11, perhaps. Second page of chapter 11. <clears throat> I'll just read this introduction to the Pocket family. There were three ladies in the room and one gentleman. Before I had been standing at the window five minutes, they somehow conveyed to me that they were all toadies and humbugs, but that each of them pretended not to know that the others were toadies and humbugs, because the admission that he or she did know it would have made him or her out to be a toady and a humbug. So my, my, my question is, at what point do we realize that we're reading an observation from the mature narrator and not the boy Pitt? Or does it intrude? Are we, or are we thrown at all when we have an observation that the boy probably could not have made. Claire? Yeah, I hate to sound like a uh, college freshman, uh, but I have a simple question. What is a humbug in the, the, <laughs> the way they were defining it in, in, in their, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in his Dickens time? Because I know, of course, it's used a lot in uh, Christmas Carol. And uh, I've looked it up and come up with different definitions. I'd love to hear what some of you really knowledgeable people think it, 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 it meant. <laughs> okay, I'll put my hand down. <laughs> but John can help me. I, I think it meant fake, affected, affectation, phony. <laughs> John, what would you say? Etymology unknown. Unknown, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, various speculations. But the meaning is generally something which is false and pretentious, um, untrue, nonsensical, um, removed, far removed from the truth. So what is then he says they pretended not to know that the others are like that, because if they admitted to knowing, it will make them like that. What is a toady? <laughs> what is a toady? I don't know. <laughs> no. Barbara knows. Irene or somebody Margaret. who Irene Margaret yeah 
both of these words, I think, are common enough in the English usage, maybe not in the American usage. But uh, you know, toady is somebody who bends over backwards to make themselves popular. I would say a toady. Uh, I just totally, <laughs> totally insincere. So the two words go very well together. Yes, Margaret. So, yeah. Margaret, you're muted. I thank you. I like that definition of toady that the lady just gave to us. But uh, the the phrase that comes to mind about that uh, that last paragraph that was read about uh, Pip's take on the relatives. It it and it it is just the expression. It takes one to know one. <laughs> so, I mean, that's all that I have to say about that. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And David? Uh, I think of humbug as having replaced an 18th century word that we really need to reclaim. <clears throat> Dr. Johnson was fond of calling something can't, C-A-N-T. You could can't as a verb. Can't was a noun. Uh, <clears throat> can't was saying something that you didn't really believe, but that was sounded good. It was what you were supposed to say. We're sending our thoughts and prayers is can't. Yeah. And humbug is a lot of, has a lot of that, it seems to me. Bill. But back to Wayne's original question, at what point do we determine that uh, Pip, that, that the comments aren't child Pips, that they're adult Pips? Because indeed, I found it a little offsetting that we got into that little thing about they were hypocrites. And if they admitted that they were hypocrites, then, or if they admitted the others were hypocrites, that would prove that they were. I had to think about that for a couple of seconds. Then I went into the next paragraph and it's like, that doesn't really fit. You know, the description of the scene as told by a te uh, as told by you know, a young teenager, or I'm not certain exactly what the age is at this point, um, didn't really seem to match someone who had the understanding that all of these people are just waiting for the lady to die so they could have her money. Um, it, so yeah, it does seem like that's something he realized at some point later, and perhaps as we go along the novel, we'll figure out at what point he realizes that the the relatives are you know odious, but. That would, you know, it inf it did influence my later reading in that. Well, I don't know that the kid understands that, but certainly I now understand what they are. Well, I just wanted to take a minute to look at Camilla's effort here. It's on page eighty six. And um, that would be about the um, seventh page of chapter 11, page 86. Then don't think of me, retorted Miss Havisham. Very easily said, remarked Camilla, amiably repressing a sob, while a hitch came into her upper lip and her tears overflowed. Raymond is a witness. What ginger and sad, sal volatile, I am obliged to take in the night. Raymond is a witness. What nervous jerkings I have in my legs chokings and nervous jerkings, however, are nothing new to me when I think with anxiety of those I love. If I could be less affectionate and more sensitive, I should have a better digestion and an iron set of nerves. I am sure I wish it could be so, but as to not thinking of you in the night, the idea. Here, a burst of tears. 
The Raymond referred to, I understood, to be the gentleman present and him I understood to be Mr. Camilla. He came to the rescue at this point and said in a consolatory and complimentary voice, Camilla, my dear, it is well known that your family feelings are gradually undermining you to the extent of making one of your legs shorter than the other. <laughs> right. <laughs> Although her, her family feelings would have been much better off if she didn't have an aunt with a dining room filled with roaches and mice. Right. I just got to say. Yeah. <laughs> Martha, is that a hand raise? Yeah, go ahead. You're muted. Um, given the fact that somebody just said something about um, Miss Afflesham, maybe we should talk about her a little bit about why the poor thing got into the position she's in now. I mean, think about her devastation of being jilted and and what it's that done to her and then what she's doing to Stella and um it's just mind-boggling well again like oh uh the uh injury to Mrs. Joe I wonder if Dickens hadn't seen someone like this or heard of someone like this. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> I don't, I don't I, I, there must have been, uh, this is an age when uh, of course families hid the mentally ill members in the attic mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. pretended they weren't there and didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so in a way she's hid herself right. in her bedroom this way. Mm -hmm. One explanation anyway, but why she's, mentally ill is another story. Well, it's very yeah. sad. But also, I'd have, I'd, I think I'd have more uh, sympathy for her, but what she's taken, taken those feelings and transferred it to mm -hmm. Stella is really, really awful. Margaret? Okay, here I come. Uh, well, Miss Havisham has a great deal of control. She controls the clocks. She controls her surroundings. It is her choice. She made a choice. And she also has the power, like we just heard of the power she has over the relatives with whatever money she has and the closed business, the closed brewery business. But uh, to me, she is a pathetic figure, of course, and but she is a powerful presence in the story and to Pip. And that must be one of the things that uh, drew him back to the uh, to the situation that he, he faced there was that he had met a very powerful woman and in the sense that uh, his sister was powerful also. So uh, that's my little contribution here in this one. Thanks. So thus far, the women in this novel are the strong ones. Well, it depends upon what your one's idea of strength is. Like right, there's a great right, strength right, right. in in uh in joe i mean the, the strength of kindness of compassion of uh, of loving care that he gives to uh to pip and also uh, about control uh joe says that that uh, descri describing how pip got his name he said he gave the name to himself when he was a uh, a little one and uh, so he and pip himself invented his name and that shows his his sense of control not only in the narration of the story, but in his character, that he is a very, uh, not in the bad sense of controlling person, but a, uh, a person who is 
on top of things from the very beginning. Barbara? Uh, Barbara Rainey, sorry. And then. Barbara well, Rainey. we're not mentioning, once again, the, the fact that this all goes to the larger theme, right? We've got the theme of, of can you create a person uh, from as you desire uh, that person to act and be, and that person will be. Um, that will be a satisfactory thing for all, you know. We have the parallel stories there that are that he's setting up for us. Barbara Franco. I really am fascinated with Miss Havisham. I don't think of her as mentally ill at all. I think of her as carrying this, I think she's one of the really interesting female characters that Dickens writes about. And I feel like he gives her this incredibly heavy burden. I mean, at, for a woman at that time to be stood up at the altar, to be living that kind of life, to internalize that kind of pain and disappointment, especially how it happened, is translates into such bitterness. Um, that time would stop for a woman who who underwent that kind of humiliation and 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 calling out. What she did to Estella uh, is not that uncommon for what parents you know do to their children, using them as an extension as you know their own disappointments in life. It's it's so interesting to me the way Dickens wrote her in the way it translates into the room and leaving the food and, you know, the, the kind of paralyzing moment that it was. So I, I just see her as when she constantly says, who am I to be kind? You know, it's, it's such an expression to me of the human condition and no what, what a woman would feel carrying that around and what her family really did to her and what she became. Um, so I, I don't see it so much as insanity, but as such an experience into the human condition and what can happen to you. I find her fascinating. If you're interested particularly, I think um, modern take on Ms. Havisham is a short story written by uh, Catherine Ann Porter, The Jilting of Granny Weatherall. The Jilting of Granny Weatherall, which is a stunning story, but I think it was inspired by Miss Havisham, the character of Miss Havisham. Yeah. Lena, and then David and Janet. Okay, well, I want to talk about Miss Havisham in terms of her fairy tale resonance. Um, it occurs to me that she's kind of like Sleeping Beauty, only instead of the prince waking her up with a kiss, it's the prince who, you know, deserts her. Uh, it's an inversion almost of Sleeping Beauty. But I really think that at some level, Dickens must have had that that resonance in his mind when he created this character. David? Uh, I'm not sure whether one can call Miss Havisham narcissistic, but her response to the shock of being jilted is to make herself the center of the world and everything about her. Of course, this sort of situation turns up fairly often in 19th century literature of one sort and another, ranging from uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's Trial by Jury to uh, music hall songs. The one I think of is uh, there was I waiting at the church, 
waiting at the church, waiting at the church, when I found he'd left me in the lurch. Lord, how it did upset me. He sent me round a note. Here's the very note. This is what he wrote. I can't get away to marry you today. My wife won't let me. Now I'll let somebody else get relevant. Janet? Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I thought, thought that was incredibly relevant, David, and I absolutely agree with Barbara and Glenna's characterization of Miss Haversham. And I think um, Glenna used the word desertion, which was really key because a lot of orphans found themselves in the workhouse because, um, because of a, a broken engagement where, um, you know, there was a promise of marriage and then there was a, a pregnancy and then and then they were deserted. So, you know, Dickens, with his familiarity with the workhouse, had to have known that, which makes that incredibly relevant, I think. Um, and the other point I wanted to make, um, this kind of seems off topic now, but I wanted to circle back to the beginning about being ashamed of home and just clarify really quickly that Dickens lived outside of the Marshall Sea when he worked at the blacking factory. The rest of the family um, lived in the prison and he would go there and eat, um, but he actually lodged outside of there at, at Camden Town uh, and then closer to the prison. And in For Forster's life is the story uh, that um, Wayne had relayed, I think, at the beginning um, of going to another house. Uh, Dickens is sick and he has to leave the factory. And an older boy insists on walking him home. And uh, he says, uh, I got better and quite easy towards evening, but Bob, who was much bigger and older than I, did not like the idea of my going home alone and took me under his protection. I was too proud to let him know about the prison. And after making several efforts to get rid of him, to all of which Bob Fagan in his goodness was deaf, shook hands with him on the steps of a house near Suffolk Bridge on the Surrey side, making believe that I lived there. As a finishing piece of reality, in case of his looking back, I knocked at the door, I recollect, and asked when that woman opened it, if that was Mr. Robert Fagan's house. I just wanted to make a little, a little clarification where that story came from. Thank you. John? About Miss Havisham, um, just to pick up a couple of threads, she's a complex character, and I think we need to understand both the fairy tale dimensions of her as a sleeping beauty. I think that's a wonderful idea. She's stopped time, uh, she's stopped the clocks, she's preserved that moment, but it's a horrible moment. It's a moment of trauma for her. And I think another way to read her psychologically is as a victim of trauma who has memorialized the trauma in the form of her room, her stopped clocks, her clothing, um, her refusal to know what day it is or what time it is. Um, and that Dickens is uh, exploring the many dimensions of this character, both mythic, fairy tale, um, psychological and and human. So all of these responses, it seems to me, are, are, are pertinent. And also the dimension of patriarchy, that she is a victim of a system of male dominance. Um, and she is attempting as best she can in the only way she can to get revenge on that system through Estella. And Pip is a kind of training dummy for Estella to practice on. Well, gang, it's almost five o'clock my time. So I guess we need to wind it down. Thank you.
all so much for attending and for your wonderful contributions. Thank you, Wayne.